watching Capitol Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. Last week, mainstay Republican in Congress, John Shimkus, the longest tenured Republican in Illinois on Capitol Hill, announced he would not seek re-election in 2020. That set off a bit of a scramble for younger, more ambitious Republicans to try and make a bid for that seat. One of them joins us now, State Representative Mike Marin from Fithian. Uh, good to have you with us. Glad to be here, Mark. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. You're, this is your, you haven't even finished your first term in Springfield yet, uh, so voters may still be getting to know you a little bit. Sure, yeah, I, I'm uh, pretty new. I uh, grew up on a family farm outside of Fithian. I'm a fifth generation farmer and I lived there my entire life except for when I went away to college. Uh, came back and, and got started in uh, local politics about 10 years ago. Started out on the township level and uh, moved up. I was a county board chairman in Vermilion County for four years and uh, uh, currently serving uh, my first term in the Illinois General Assembly. And what has it been like being a Republican in the super minority in Springfield? Well, uh, the first thing I'll say, it's, it's an honor to, to walk into this beautiful building every day and represent the people of the 104th District. Uh, but it's also been frustrating. It's, it's been a little overwhelming. I mean, it's, uh, uh, there's been a lot of stuff happen. You know, people uh, agree whether you like the governor's agenda or didn't like the governor's agenda. Everybody pretty well agreed that it was a historic session that a lot of things uh, happened. And so, you know, for your first session, it was, it was pretty uh, overwhelming at times. But, uh, it, you know, I was glad to be here, glad to give a strong voice to the 104th District, and uh, it's an honor. So halfway through your first term in Springfield, how do you go to the voters across the 15th and say, I'm the guy for Congress, I'm the right person for the job? Do you have much to show for your time here yet? What do you have to show for it? Well, I think I have accomplished uh, some pretty significant things in my first term, which I feel pretty good about. Uh, I was able to, to pass three bills uh, that, that I sponsored on my own. I was uh, uh, one of the chief co-sponsors on Senate Bill 9, the Coal Ash Prevention Act, which is incredibly important to my home district, uh, and worked with uh, Senator Scott Bennett to get that done. And uh, so I feel really good about the first term. You know, as we go out and we explore this process, you know, I think one thing that, that strikes me uh, as very important is that there's never been a time like now where we're uh, in more critical need for good leadership. And so part of the evaluation of whether we're gonna actually jump into this thing or not is to evaluate where can my leadership be most effective. Is it more effective here in the state house, staying here in, my, uh, 100, in the 104th uh, state rep seat, or is it going on to Washington and, and serving the 15th congressional district? And I should clarify, on Tuesday, the day after Labor Day, you announced an exploratory committee, which is often a sort of half step or a half measure toward announcing an official run, but you haven't officially really thrown your hat in the ring just yet. That's correct. You know, I mean... What's that timeline like? Well, you know, we're hoping to have a decision probably by early to mid-October. But, you know, this is not something I take lightly. This is a serious decision. It's, it has, uh, you know, certainly I, I need to talk to voters in the 15th Congressional District. I need to talk to voters back home in the 104th. And uh, it's going to be a serious, serious process uh, as we work through uh, the positive and the negatives. And really it comes down to where can I do the most good. You're in Springfield. You know, this is Illinois, of course, you know this. And mm -hmm. uh, conservative Republican politics in this state uh, has been certainly of late, very uh, tax averse and, and not a big, not a lot of fans of raising taxes in the, the Republican uh, base, in the Republican primary especially. How do you navigate that course and tell voters that you're still the guy for the job when they find out that you voted to double the gas tax? I, you know, I go into this with my eyes wide open and I know that I'm gonna have to answer for that vote. I'm sure people aren't happy about that. I, I'm not happy about paying more in gas. But tax. how do you answer that question? So uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I got the opportunity of a lifetime a few years ago to travel to Brazil as a, a member of the Illinois Soybean Association. And I actually did a speaking tour in Brazil, uh, Mato Grosso, the soybean growing capital of Mato Grosso. And, uh, you know, 25 years ago, the people there were just learning how to grow soybeans. And now they outproduce us because we only have one growing season a year and they have three growing seasons. And so we were traveling from, uh, it would be like traveling from Springfield to Decatur to Champaign. But we had to fly in an airplane, a small airplane, because the roads were impassable. When I uh, load a truck on my farm in the fall, it'll come back if, if the elevator's busy and that truck has to wait in line at the elevator, it'll be back to our farm in an hour. When you load a truck in Brazil 
on a farm, it may be days before that truck comes back. Our farmers, our manufacturers have an immense competitive advantage over our foreign competitors, over the competitors in other states because of our transportation infrastructure. But that transportation infrastructure is starting to, to, to fail because we haven't maintained it well. And so it wasn't a, a fun vote to take, but it was something that I felt, felt was very important. And beyond that, you know, I've, I've got a, a wife and a daughter, and I send them off to school every morning, and I want to know that they're driving on safe roads, safe bridges. So, you know, that competitive advantage, the safety, the good quality of our, our roads and bridges, that's, that's why I made that decision. You are right there along the border with Indiana. There was uh, some uh, political rhetoric and argument and perhaps even just uh, cold hard facts, economic facts, that some people would try to shop for gas, especially if they lived in the border uh, in Indiana as opposed to buying it here. Have you seen any of that? You know, I don't think so. I think people uh, say that. But, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, a lot of it's convenience, uh, where you fill up your gas tank. And you, the last time I checked, and it's been a while since I've checked, but the last time I was driving through Indiana, gas prices were actually higher in Indiana than they were at home in Illinois. So if the people of the 15th district in Illinois rally behind your campaign, and Mr. Marin does indeed go to Washington, there's a debate brewing there right now that sure. would institute the vehicle miles tax or some variation of it. So you may be asked yet again to raise the tax that commuters pay on the roads. Are you prepared to take that vote? Well, I mean, we'll have to look at the, the final product, what the legislation looks like. I will say this, I, I think uh, transportation infrastructure is crit critically important. You know, I, I, I not, I'm a uh, conservative Republican, I don't like taxes, uh, and I, I don't certainly like to raise taxes, but uh, trans transportation infrastructure is critically important. If you take, uh, you know, a list of what government should be doing, transportation infrastructure is one of the things that tops the list. But Wednesday night, you may have seen, if you watch CNN, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of Democrats running for president talked about their plans to address climate change, and among those ideas were, were to convert uh, almost our entire fleet of American vehicles to e uh, electric vehicles over time. And if and when that effort succeeds, there's going to be fewer people pumping gas at the pump, and that, that revenue stream could evaporate. So is there some wisdom in planning forward, uh, looking for ways to assess that tax on the, the wear and tear of our roads differently? Well, you know, certainly we're going to have to adjust to changes. Uh, personally, I think if we're going to uh, go towards electric vehicles, I think that should be a decision that's driven by the marketplace. I'm a free market guy. And, but obviously, there's always changes. There's changes in the market. There's, there's changes in policy that affect things. And so we are going to have to be able to adjust, no question about it. Uh, you know, I, I'm not in favor of the government monitoring where we're driving. I, I, I think that that's something that's problematic. But, uh, you know, And that's obviously. one of many different ideas, the sure. tracking device to, to register the distance and all that. Absolutely. There are other ways to get at that apple. Absolutely, and, and we're going to have to take a look at that as, as these changes occur. Uh, very interesting. Let's talk about Congress for a little bit. Uh, how would you rate Congressman Shimkus, and did you speak with him before announcing this exploratory committee? Do you, do, do you have his blessing? I, I was able to talk to the congressman yesterday morning, so it, it was after we announced. But, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the congressman, I can't say enough about him and the service that he did for the, the 15th Congressional District. And, uh, you know, the time that I was the county board chairman in Vermillion County, he was always a phone call away. He was always just tremendously helpful. Uh, the thing that I feel the proudest about in my public service to this point is the fact that uh, we acquired the old federal courthouse in Danville as our county administration building. And uh, that was just uh, an unbelievable uh, thing that the county was able to accomplish uh, to actually uh, locate our, our, our new administrative home there. And Congressman Shimkus was... Uh, just critically important in that whole process. And so he's, he's always been available. He's always looked out for our needs. And it's a big loss. Uh, you know, whoever replaces him is going to have huge shoes to fill. When members go to Congress, and, and these things sort of morph and evolve over time, but they often have a, a pet project, uh, mm -hmm. Congressman Shimkus with energy and, and a few other things. There, there are uh, different specialties that, that members of Congress can develop over time and they can pour their passion into. What, what is that for you? Well, I think, you know, given my background and my passion and kind of how I got started in, in politics uh, was advocacy for agriculture. That, that's my background, being a fifth-generation family farmer. 
And, you know, I, I love agriculture. And so I think agriculture, rural issues, those are the things that will probably be foremost on my mind when I go to Congress. Um, we've, we've seen a number of sitting state senators who've been around Springfield for a while already. Uh, they, they considered running for this seat. They bowed out of it. Um, handicapped the field for us. Uh, other different people who are out there, I'm sure you've had conversations with people. You're aware of who may also be looking at, at the race. Uh, why are you a better pick uh, for this seat than, say, Erica Harold? Well, you know, I, I, first of all, I'm confident in my leadership ability. I feel like every level of government I've served, uh, I've been able to accomplish some, some pretty significant things by uh, actually, you know, uh, garnering support for initiatives and moving them forward and improving things. And I felt like every level of government that I served, I think we, we left it better than, than I found it. And so, you know, certainly, though, the, the names out there, they're, they're going to be uh, a tough opponents if they get in the race, you know. Uh, is there some strategic advantage to you jumping in now or, or, or announcing your exploratory committee, sort of marking your territory? Well, you know, I, I'm personally a, a guy that's uh, maybe I'm just aggressive by nature, but, you know, I, I always like to, to jump out and, uh, you, know, you know, get out there at the front of things. I, I'm one that, that likes to lead the charge. And so it's just kind of in my nature to, to do so. But, you know, certainly the names that have been thrown out there, they're going to, they've, they've all done a great job, the, the state senators uh, here uh, representing their districts. They're good colleagues and friends of mine, and uh, they would be formidable opponents. Senator Jason Plummer is one who many people, many Republican people expect to jump into this race. Uh, he's someone who strongly opposed uh, raising gas taxes. He's someone who could make that claim that he's more conservative because he opposed that. You mentioned, though, prior that not only did you reach across the aisle and vote with that, uh, that infrastructure bill to raise the gas tax, but also with Senator Bennett on the coal ash and that environmental issue. Um, what is the difference? And, and can you make that argument that, that, there's a, that there's a benefit to reaching across the aisle, even in a deep red Republican district, compared to the, the, the more uh, strident conservative view that, that uh, compromise is sometimes a dirty word? Well, you know, I think there's times when you can't compromise your principles. You, you have to stand up. You've got to stand up for the values of your district. What are some examples of that for you where you won't compromise? Well, you know, I think we've got to hold the line on spending uh, better than, than what we've done. Uh, you know, I, I vo voted no on the budget because it was the, the highest uh, budget in the history of the state of Illinois. You know, that's something that I, I think that we've got to do a better job on. And, uh, you know, I, was, I, I didn't support the... Uh, the the, the Senate bill on gun control, the, the uh, fingerprinting for FOID cards, uh, I, the, the uh, expansion, uh, the abortion expansion bill, I was a strong no on that. And uh, those are times when, you know, I, I, those are things I can't compromise on. So when, when, if and when a person like Senator Plummer jumps into the race and says, I'm more conservative than you because I oppose all of those things and you accepted some of them, how do you confront that? Well, you know, I, I think that my values align with the district very well. You know, uh, I, I think that if you took a, a poll, I think almost on every single issue, I would be aligned with the district. And so, uh, you know, who's more conservative or not, I don't know that that matters. I've got the best uh, interest of the district in mind, especially it's a, a largely rural agricultural district. That's my background, that's, that's my bread and butter. So. Uh, you know, he can claim to be more conservative, but, uh, you know, I, I think I fit the district pretty well. Uh, President Trump has really supercharged a lot of the personality mm -hmm. in American politics, and there, there are personal clashes. Setting that aside for, for a moment, and, and some of his style, on matters of policy and on matters of public debate about where the country is heading and where the country should go, can the people of the 15th district expect you to disagree with this president on anything? Is there something that that you think this president's doing that, that you'd advise him to do differently? Well, I mean, I, I'm not going to make a blanket statement that I'll always agree with somebody all the time. But So I, far from what you know, we've had a pretty fair sample size of this sure. president. Are there any, is there anywhere where you disagree with him? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, on, on policy issues, I'm pretty aligned with the president. You know, I, I, I think that uh, I, I support him on, on most of the issues. Now, you know, the, the rhetoric, uh, you know, sometimes I, I on think... On his trade war with China? On his trade war. You know what? I think with the trade war, people understand, and people in rural America understand, that this is a fight that's worth fighting. You know, it's... Uh, China's been... Even as John Deere shuts down 20% of its production. You know, it, it's tough, but it, it's a fight that's got to be fought. And, and I, you know, I got to give the president props for being courageous enough to take this on. And, and I, 
I talk to farmers about this, and that's what they tell me. This is a fight that's worth fighting because, you know, China does things like manipulate currency that, that hurts everybody in this country. And if uh, we could get a better trade deal, it would help everybody. And so it's certainly not a, a great time for agriculture. You know, we're five years into a, a, a downward price cycle where commodity prices have been depressed. And, uh, you know, the weather has been just very challenging on the farm this year. So it, it's, it is a tough time. And I think that's important that we support the president when uh, he introduces programs like the, the market access payment uh, for farmers who are, who are suffering because of the trade war. It's been some time, many decades, but there was a, a time when conservatives and Republicans uh, had the high ground when it came to the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe back to D Teddy Roosevelt uh, in that era. Um, you mentioned your vote on coal ash. I, I, it makes me curious what your views are of the environment. Uh, one of the entry questions to that conversation is always, uh, to what extent are humans contributing to climate change? Well, I, I know a couple things for certain. I, I know that, that the climate's been changing forever. I mean, I think there's, there's you know, ample historical evidence for that. But as oceans get warmer and we emit more fossil fuels? You know, I, I, I don't claim to be an expert on climatology or I'm just not, but I, I will say this. Uh, you know, I think coming from an agricultural background, uh, you know, I, I've lived farming my entire life and I know some of the most environmentally conscious people uh, anywhere are farmers. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the model that, that I've grown up with. When you talk about the future of the planet and environmentalism and the things that are important, you look at the fact that we've been able to, to just maximize our food production while uh, creating great efficiencies in the way we do that. We lower the use of resources that we have to use. Uh, and certainly, you know, that's through technological advancement, but it's also through farmers and, and people in manufacturing getting better at what they're doing and, and being more environmentally conscious. So I think there's a way to do it uh, and do it in a responsible way where we're not hurting our economy. President Trump has said he can save the coal industry and revive it and bring it back. Is, is that a wise policy move? Well, you know, I think I'm uh, of the opinion that, you know, we're at a time right now where energy is pretty plentiful. But not so long ago, uh, we had a lot of energy scarcity. And so, you know, I think I'm a guy, when you talk about energy, all options need to be on the table. And certainly we've Including got- Including restoring, bringing back coal to its former levels of production? Yeah, well, I think the market should drive that. I th like I said before, I'm a free market It is guy. currently, and coal is getting more expensive and it's not competing and people are closing plants. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the market at play. Well, you know, I'm a free market guy and I, ultimately I think the market should be driving those decisions. But if coal's viable and it's something that we need as an energy resource, then sure, it should be on the table. It, we ought to be able to utilize that and utilize the, the coal stores that we have in, in this state that are critically important to this district. Put a finer point on that for me because the president and, and the EPA and and the, the policies set by this administration are changing the rules of the road for the market. If not completely tipping the scales of the market, they're changing the way things go by, by, uh, th through a number of different policies. So, so to what extent should the market just dictate everything, and when does government get involved? Because for this example, if, if this is a country of the people, not of different corporations, and, and if you believe that the purpose of government is to serve the people and not the bottom line of shareholders and their immediate near-term profits, when does government step in to intervene or to regulate uh, the energy uh, industry? Well, certainly, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the, the school of thought that we should rely on the market first and foremost. I, I just do. And I, to the extent that people are manipulating the market through policies, picking winners and losers, you know, I, I'm not in favor of that. Uh, that is something that, you know, I, I, I'm a free market guy. I think the market should dictate you know, what resources we're using. But when big railroads were just starting to expand here in Springfield and across Illinois and really creating the, the, the bedrock of that infrastructure uh, hub that Illinois has since become and railroad corporations were trampling over the workers and even sometimes the passengers harming them, causing bodily injury, it was then House Representative Abraham Lincoln who stepped up and lawyer Abraham Lincoln who went to the courthouse and court, uh, courthouses and defended the rights of individuals as they were being, uh, their, their personal safety, their health, was being run roughshod over by these corporations. So there, there does seem to be, in the Republican line of thinking, some latitude for government to intervene and protect people from the more immediate 
uh, greed of, of companies. Where's that line for you? Well, sure. I, you know, we have to act in the best interest. And for instance, on the coal ash bill, you know, you've got certain power generation plants that, that have been responsible and they've stole, excuse me, stored coal ash responsibly. And, and then you've got an example like what we have at the Middle Fork where they left 3.3 million cubic yards coal ash along Illinois' only national scenic river. And so when there's a problem like that, you know, I, I think it's responsible for the government to regulate. Uh, you know, ultimately, I don't think the government should be involved in the process of picking winners and losers in the marketplace. So it sounds but, like, if I'm reading you correctly, that you're fine with coal companies uh, mining and burning as much coal as they want so long as they care for its waste responsibly. Sure. I mean, people need to act responsibly. Corporations need to act responsibly. And that's one of our roles in government is to make sure that we put that framework in place so that people know what the, the guidelines are for acting responsibly. So I, I would agree with that. But on the economic front, yeah, the, the market should drive the decisions. All right. So uh, looking forward, a ways to go until I think December is the deadline for candidates to get into this race. And then after that, uh, just a little bit, uh, it's a kind of a sprint to the mm -hmm. primary race there where uh, this district, I think Congressman Shimkus got 71 percent of the vote in 2018, most expected to be still a, a pretty red district in 2020 come November. So what are, in your view, the biggest issues, the biggest points of debate that, that Republicans should be having now in this short window of time we have, and we expect to have many of these candidates on this show, what, what are the biggest points of, of debate and matters important to people at home in the 15th district? Well, I think ultimately, you know, we've got to keep the economy going. Uh, we've seen a, a great uh, revival in, in, in the economy over the last few years, and I think ultimately uh, that's probably the most important thing. I think, you know, a lot of times people in, in rural and downstate America, or downstate Illinois, feel like they've been left behind. They feel like uh, the opportunities that once existed don't exist anymore. And so with this re economic revival, I think there's a great opportunity to bring some of that uh, prosperity back uh, into some of the rural areas and, and really improve things and uh, uh, work on rural development. And so, you know, I think ultimately it all comes down to that. And if, my last question mm -hmm. for you, uh, if what some economists see in the offings becomes true, and if uh, lagging consumer confidence, which is often an economic indicator of the future, uh, that those low numbers, if those bear out to become a dipping or a stagnant economy in these waning months of President Trump's first term, will that be a sign that the president's uh, economic gambles didn't all pay off? Well, you know, certainly, you know, hopefully there's not any slowdown in the economy. Uh, I have faith. Uh, that, you know, the, the pro-growth uh, policies of the president are going to hold out. The tax cuts. Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I've got to, I, I'm confident in that. I, I think, you know, it's, uh, uh, and I if, think. And if they don't, is that a sign that, that those tax cuts failed? Well, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're going to go there. I don't think that, that's, that, that it's going to happen. I, we may have to do some more adjusting, more uh, uh, do a few more things. The economy is a fickle beast. It is. It is. That, that's for sure. And there's a lot of things that, that play into it. But I'm confident. Uh, I think that uh, things are going to play out for the best. All right. Representative Mike Marin joining us. A lengthy conversation. Uh, you can catch the full uh, conversation up on our website online. Thanks for joining us. Okay. We're back in a moment.